Okay. All right. Good morning. Greetings to you in the name of the Lord. It's great to see you here on this sixth Sunday after Pentecost, which also happens to be Independence Day. So thank you for, for joining us. And um, uh, those of you who are joining us via the internet on Facebook or on uh, YouTube, thank you for joining us as well. Please know that we are open uh, fully um, and uh, welcome anyone who would, uh, who would like to visit anytime. So hopefully we will see you soon. Uh, if you would, please, I'd ask you to fill out the attendance register. Uh, pass that along the pew. If you're here for the first time, if you would give us your your name, address, phone number, and the email address, that would be that would be really helpful, and we'll be in contact with you this week. While you're doing that, uh, a couple of things to mention. One is welcome back uh, to uh, our, our Edge participants, uh, Sophie especially. Glad to have you back. And from everything I heard, they had a they had a terrific time. Yes, yeah, sure enough. Um, so uh, there, um, Brad, and presumably, uh, actually, I think it's going to be something of a of a traveling road show. They had they had kids from three different churches go, and so they're going to do a presentation about how how things went and what they what they found out, what they learned, and so on. Um, uh, at all three. So the one here will be two weeks from now on the 18th. So uh, you will be hearing more about, about the edge before very long. Um, also want to mention that a week from today, uh, we will be having our first uh, uh, fellowship lunch, uh, potluck, um, in I don't know, six and a half years. I, I, I don't know how long it's been at this point. It's, it seems like it's been a long time. So uh, however long it's been, it's been too long. And so we're going to be doing that next week. Uh, bring a side dish or dessert. Um, the uh, deacons will be providing the main course. And uh, we're really looking forward to that, uh, especially Gus, but, but really, yeah. Really, uh, all of us are are uh, are very much looking forward to that. So um, you can take note of the other items in the bulletin. And oh, actually, there is one other thing that I wanted to mention, and that is we have our, our children's event, uh, summer children's event coming up on July twenty seventh, which is a Tuesday. And if you can provide an extra pair of hands and eyes. For that, uh, speak to any member of the children, youth, and family team about participating. All right, let's worship the Lord. Thank you. 
Good morning. I'm glad that Miss Linda played that. I had been practicing the Star Spangled Banner all morning. It was my good morning song to my family. They thought it was great. So, but anyway, so that was that was really beautiful. Uh, please stand with me for the call to worship this morning. Call to worship is from uh, Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come this morning to worship you, to honor you, to glorify you, Father, we just request that your presence would be made real to us. God, we thank you for the mystery that happens as your people gather together in your name. Father, that you inhabit the praises of those people, that where, where we are gathered, you are there. And so, Father, we thank you for that. God, illuminate to us your word today, that we may be obedient, that we may observe all that you have commanded. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 14, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. And trust me, I'm not doing this a cappella. So. <laughs> okay. I think they pranked me or something this morning. I don't know, so. Rejoice ye pure in heart. Rejoice, give thanks and sing.
Also remember in prayer the Larry Miles family grieving the loss of husband, father, and grandfather. We pray for Bobby Hoyle as he continues to battle cancer as he is starting a new trial treatment. We pray for all of our first EPC family and friends who are dealing with chronic health issues. We pray for those who are carrying burdens unknown to the rest of us, whether they be physical, emotional, relational, or any other type. We pray for our, mil our military, our police, fire, and first responders. We pray for our country and ask you to heal the divisions within the, di the different political parties, classes, and races, and let us always look toward you for guidance and strength to make change happen. We pray for our government on every level, our president, our governor, our county commissioners, our mayor, as well as all of our local boards and commissions. We lift this all up to you and are grateful that your son taught his disciples his prayer saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and his glory forever. Amen. We are a, a blessed people. We all know that our country is not perfect. We also know that we have freedoms here to be the people of God that are, if not unique, then highly unusual in the world that we live in. And that's a reason to give thanks. And we do give thanks today. And as we do so, may we express our gratitude through the presentation of our tithes and offerings. Uh, before, uh, um, before I begin, let me just simply mention, uh, Simple Gifts is a tune that almost certainly you know, even if you don't know the title. It's an old shaker hymn. If you're not familiar with the Shakers, there's really really no reason why you should be. They're, they're a sect that began in the mid-19th century in Pennsylvania. And uh, one of the unfortunate traits of this sect was a misreading of the New Testament to believe that Christians should be celibate, all of them. Uh, as a consequence, uh, especially because they also weren't particularly evangelistically minded, uh, there are no more shakers. Ah, uh, well, however, however, they, they uh, have left a musical heritage that, uh, that reaches its pinnacle in Simple Gifts, which was used as part of Aaron Copeland's uh, orchestral suite at the Appalachian suite, so you may remember it from that. <laughs>
Good morning. Uh, continuing with the history lesson, following the information about the Shakers, I have been given permission to give you a very brief Revolutionary War history. The Revolutionary War began in 1775 and ended in 1783. Following the war, 16 known Revolutionary War soldiers made their way to Union County, Illinois and lived here. And most of them are buried here. At least 12 to 14 of them are. Uh, some are in church cemeteries, some are in town cemeteries, and many of them are buried on their private land, on farms where they live. Some of you could be and probably are related to these men as most of their names are still commonly found in the county. Alexander Beggs, Patrick Corgan, Joseph Edwards, John Ellis, Jacob Frick, John Hargrave, Jacob Langle, Christopher Lyla, Peter Meisenheimer, Peter Miller, Elias Moyers, John B. Murray, William Sams, John Sowers, Joshua Vick, and Matthias Zimmerman. I just thought that was interesting. <laughs> the scripture reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 12. A life pleasing to God. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctifications, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgresses and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you brothers to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Thank you. Please stand as you're able for our next hymn. Make sure, okay, yeah, I've got somebody to thank you. Number 389, Pure in Heart, O God.
gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 5. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Uh, before I, I begin, uh, two things. One is, uh, Shirley, do I understand correctly? You didn't realize you were playing this morning? Well, that's a, that, that, no, that's not a problem. Uh, and yet, just slid right in. Just <laughs> thank you very much. Um, not a note missed without any practice, right? <laughs> I wish I could say that. I practiced for two days and look what I did. And as far as that goes, that's the other thing. I sat down and Marianne said, you forgot to pray over the offering. I knew there was something missing. This is what happens when you think more about what you're doing than what God is doing. So even though it's late, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the freedom that we celebrate today, uh, freedom that enables us to go into the world as well as to worship you, uh, to go and to bring your good news to every creature. We thank you for the freedom that you've gifted us with. And our prayer is that you would use us, even as you use our offerings, uh, to bring about the extension of your kingdom and the freedom that it promises to us, freedom from sin, freedom to be your people. Father, we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. When I uh, graduated from high school, uh, I, uh, like most folks who do that, uh, had my picture taken and it appeared in my high school yearbook. Anybody else do that? Yeah, of course. I mean, you've all, you've all done that. Well, in, in my high school, what they, what they did was alongside your picture and your name, they allowed you to uh, write a few things. Uh, they asked, uh, what are your plans after you graduate? Not that they wanted an extensive essay or anything, just in a sentence, what are your plans? Um, what were your favorite things about about high school, what are the things that you'll remember? Uh, one of the things was what's your, what's your fondest wish? Um, and one of them was what's your favorite saying? Okay. Um, a lot of them were, you know, quotes from movies or quotes from songs, things like that. Uh, but my uh, debate partner in high school, uh, Andy, had uh, a favorite quote that I've never heard anywhere else. I think he made it up himself uh, and which has stuck with me for 45 years now. It's not like I look at my high school yearbook all the time, but I will never forget that he wrote in his, that his favorite saying was, I don't care if my, D my lettuce has DDT on it as long as it's crisp. Okay, I, I understand we have a little, we're still having some problems with the thing over here. So let me repeat that. I don't care if my lettuce has DDT on it as long as it's crisp. Now, admit it, you won't ever forget that line either, will you? Every time you eat a salad, you'll remember that line. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure exactly what he meant by that. <laughs> um, there, I mean, he was 18 years old. There's no telling what he meant, what he meant by that. But one way that I've always heard it is that he didn't care about the impurities that might be found in food or in life, uh, as long as 
things tasted good, as long as things were fun, as long as things were the way, the way he wanted them to be. Is that a reasonable, reasonable interpretation? Yeah, I, I think it probably is. Well, unfortunately, Andy, if you're listening, I have a message for you. That's not the way God thinks. God cares about the impurities. Uh, by the way, Andy is not listening, I guarantee you. Um, uh, God cares about, about the impurities in our lives. And God cares about who we are and what we do, given the purity that we are meant to have. Hence, these two Beatitudes from Jesus in verses 8 and 9. Both of them, both of them are frequently misunderstood. The first in verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart is often thought to refer to sinlessness. If I am pure in heart, that means I do not sin. I, I am always thinking about God. Uh, I am always exalting Jesus. I am always acting according to the uh, prompting of the Holy Spirit. Uh, my mind is never on myself. I always put others first. Uh, and I never think a thought that is not one that Jesus would think. That's what some people think pure in heart means. See God is thought to mean simply go to heaven. Get to heaven. Uh, so the translation, uh, the translation in our minds, what we hear when we read this, this beatitude is, blessed are the sinless, for they shall reach heaven. Both of those translations, or both halves of that translation, are a little, or at least a bit off. Uh, first, pure in heart. Pure is a translation of a Greek word, katharos. Now, katharos has a dual meaning, okay? On the one hand, it refers to cleansing or washing, okay? Uh, when you when you put your laundry in in the uh, in the um, um, washing machine, yes, thank you. I wanted to say dishwasher. I knew that wasn't right. <laughs> it was close. Yeah, <laughs> they both clean things. Uh, when you put your laundry in the uh, in the uh, washing machine, uh, you expect it to come out looking. Better, yeah, <laughs> at the very least. Uh, you, you, your hope certainly is that it will look as if it were new, okay? Even though it's not new, it may, you know, may have shrunk a bit or whatever, but, but you wouldn't see the stains that you left on it from last night's dinner. They'd be gone, all right? So cleansing or washing, that's, that's one part or, or one meaning that Katharos has. The other is, uh, it's, it was used to refer to refining metals so that they were unalloyed, okay? Um, uh, anyone, anyone here uh, have uh, gold coins? Gold coins are, are, uh, are interesting. They, you, you, will, you will read uh, uh, advertisements from those who sell gold coins or silver coins, uh, not, as, not as coins, not as collector's items like that, but rather as uh, investments in precious metals, okay? You can get, for instance, a gold bar, I suppose, but for most people, they, they consider uh, coins to be a, an easier way of doing the same thing. Well, when you get something that way, you think, all right, I have an ounce of pure gold, and you do. Have you ever noticed the percentage on it? It's not 100%. It's 99.9%. That's because in the minting process, it is essentially impossible to get absolutely everything out that is not the element 
gold, okay? There are ways of doing that. They're more complicated, they're more expensive, uh, and quite frankly, they're not worth it uh, for, for coins of that type. Uh, Catharos refers to the process by which those impurities are taken out of gold or silver or tin or bronze, whatever the metal might have been in the, uh, in the ancient world that they were using. Um, so both of them, uh, both of those meanings have to, have to do with the process of removing impurities, okay? That's important. That word does not refer to a state, but a process, okay? It doesn't refer to a state, it refers to a process. Keep that in mind, we'll come, we'll come back to that in a moment. In heart, of course, refers not to the organ in the middle of our chest, it refers to the core of ourself, to the seat of our personality, to the place where we're able to relate to others, particularly to God in faith, okay? So to be pure in heart then, refers to who we are at our core, and it refers to the idea that we are seeking to purify ourselves. We are seeking to uh, remove from ourselves what prevents us from relating wholeheartedly and completely to God. Now, the truth of the matter is that given what we are, which is a, a fallen race redeemed by, by, by Christ. Given what we are, 100% is not going to be possible in this life, okay? We can aim at it, but the chances are, are no, it's not chances are, the reality is that the best we're gonna get to is 99.9%. Now, I don't know about you, I've never known anybody, even the best Christians I've known, who, who could be fairly characterized as 99.9% pure. And that includes me. I don't know what my percentage is, but it's a lot lower than that. I don't mind telling you. Uh, however, however, as I undergo catharos, as I seek out the impurities in my heart, the ones that cause me to uh, retain bitterness against those who hurt me, that cause me to resent those who have more than me, that get in the way of my being able to love everyone around me. As I do that, that percentage is going to go up. And then, and then, when I see God, it will indeed reach 100%. Even though we're only aiming at 99.9% .9 because of the limitations of this life, believe me, we all still have a ways to go. So when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, he's not saying the sinless. He's saying those who are seeking on a on a daily basis to remove all the barriers that stand between themselves and God and others, well, they will see God. And yes, that does have an eternal component, but there's more to it than that. They will see God here and now. Uh, if you say that you know God, or that you listen to God, or that God speaks to you, in the culture that we live in, you're thought to be crazy, <laughs> okay? You're thought to be a fanatic. Uh, you're thought to be deluded. Uh, people don't hear God. People don't listen to God. Uh, God is, but he doesn't have anything like that to do, to, to do with us. No, uh, that's not what Jesus has to say. In this life, here and now, 
Seek to remove those barriers that prevent you from hearing God, from seeing God at work in yourself and in others and in the world around you. And guess what? You will see him. You will. Um, it, it may be that you'll only see him in the hindsight. Uh, certainly, as I, as I look back on, on my life, uh, I can see <laughs> countless places where I can identify God as being at work because quite frankly, if he wasn't, <laughs> whatever had happened, wouldn't, I wouldn't be standing here. I would not be someone who claims to be uh, a follower of Christ unless he had been at work. Well, I couldn't see that going on at the time. I can see that in hindsight. But part of the reason I can see that is because some of the obstacles that prevented me from doing so have moved aside. So blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God and they will express that purity in heart by being blessed as peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Unfortunately, this one's also frequently misunderstood. Uh, for a lot of folks, this is thought of um, particularly in the mainline Protestant churches as, as referring to political activism. Blessed are those who seek to bring peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Blessed are those who protest against the Iraqi, uh, the uh, United States invasion of Iraq. Blessed are those who protest against the Vietnam War. Blessed are those who lobby Congress to reduce the defense budget. Those are the peacemakers. No, those may or may not be good things to do. Okay, that's not the issue because it's not about political activism. But at the same time, it's also not about simply seeking to smooth over or avoid conflict. Okay. Uh, the peacemaker is not the one who says, well, yes, it's true. It is true that uh, in, a, in a fit of rage, uh, Jim Harris punched Mark Kirk in the face. That's, you know, that happened, but, justified. but, justified. well, I'm sure it was justified and, and, you know, but, but leave the justification aside. We're, we're not going to, we're not going to talk about it. We're, we're going to just get them to kiss and make up. Well, shake hands and make up. Um, we're going, sorry about that. I, was, I don't know what I was thinking there. Goodness. Even Mandy's reluctant to kiss and make up with him. <laughs> Um, uh, we're, we're, we're just going to act as though nothing had ever happened, okay? That, that we can just forget about this and, and everybody's going to be nice to one another and, and that's going to be peace. No, that's, that's not peacemaking either, okay? Peacemakers are those who are used by God to affect the restoration of relationships on a basis of both love and justice, okay? A peacemaker is one who, who is not one who says, it doesn't matter who was right, it doesn't matter who was wrong, the only thing that matters is that we're get al getting along. A peacemaker is also not one who just says, it doesn't matter whether you're speaking to one another or not, just cut the nonsense you know, and, and, and leave the conflict aside. Instead, the aim is for shalom. Shalom is a Hebrew word that's uh, become popular in, uh, in our, our age, um, and with good reason. Uh, shalom, by the way, is connected to the word Salem. Okay, Salem is simply another way, another form of shalom. So when you have Jerusalem, peace is in, is in the name of the city. Shalom is the word that's translated as peace, but more broadly, it refers to wholeness, which in turn refers to relationships being in, uh, restored to the form and the substance intended by God. Okay the form and substance intended by God. Now, not all relationships are meant to be the same. I don't have the same relationship with Marianne that I have with Joe Clement. 
I don't even have the same relationship with Marianne that I have with our daughter, okay? That doesn't mean that either of those, my relationship with Joe or with Rebecca, is in any way inferior to the one that I have with Marianne. It's just different, right? So when you speak of shalom, you're talking about referring to relationships that are as they are meant to be. My relationship with Marianne is that of husband, first and foremost, okay? There are, there are other elements to that, but husband first. Uh, with Joe, my relationship first is brother, okay? Not pastor, that's second, all right? Brother is first. My relationship with Rebecca is obviously father, but hopefully has other elements as well, okay? Uh, my relationship with some uh, uh, members of the congregations I've served over the years has been not just brother, but also mentor, okay? Or confidant or counselor uh, or, or any of a number of, any of a number of things. Uh, if those relationships become broken, the peacemaker is the one who helps those relationships become again what they are meant to be, okay? And to, again, use the husband-wife relationship, that doesn't simply mean if you've got two people who are on the verge of divorce, you talk them out of it, okay? Talking people who are on the verge of divorce out of doing so is only the first step. At that point, uh, shalom has not been has not been achieved. At that point, there are simply two people who uh, are angry at one another, or dislike one another, or or hate one another, or or can't stand to be in the same room with one another. Who have decided that they're going to stay together. That's not what husband and wife relationships are meant to be, okay? Uh, that's the aim, and that's what the peacemaker, the peacemaker does. And by being a peacemaker, one is called a son of God. Now, let's just say this, because for some people it needs to be said, uh, this is inclusive, okay? This is both men and women. So if you want to read that as, uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God, that's perfectly legitimate, okay? Jesus did not mean to exclude women here. But it's an indication of the priority that God places on peace, right? Is there anything higher, any title that can be given to any person any higher than being a son or a daughter of God? I don't know that there is. The peacemaker is one who is blessed in an exalted way because what they do is exactly what Jesus was seeking to do and did when he went to the cross and rose from the dead. He was seeking to repair the relationships between people and God that had been broken by sin, but now could be restored to what God wanted them and wants them to be. So, um, pure in heart, peacemakers. How about, how about peacemakers who are pure in heart? My goodness, <laughs> that's not just a blessing. That's not, just, that's not just a matter of God patting you on the back and saying, well done, good and faithful servant. To be a pure peacemaker is to be one who truly is doing God's will and doing God's work. And in the process, showing the world what it looks like to be one of God's people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the call and the blessing of making peace between your people and you, between one another, between us and the world. We thank you for that, and we thank you, too, for the call to purity, a call uh, not easy to 
carry out, but which we are able to carry out through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for that and pray that as we go back into the world following this time of worship today, that you would enable us to stand before the world as, uh, as examples of, as models of what it means to be pure, what it means to make peace, what it means to be your children. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We are called this morning to the Lord's table. And as we prepare to do that, and as we respond to the word that we have heard, may we join together in confessing our unified faith using the Apostles' Creed. Please stand as we do so. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And please join me as we, uh, re as we uh, continue our preparation for the reception of the body and blood of Christ by confessing our sin and hearing God's word of pardon. Let's pray. Hear these words that we have from the 32nd Psalm. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Through Christ our Lord, we have been forgiven. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Come then to the joyful feast of our Lord. Let's pray. We acclaim you. Holy Father, glorious in power, your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care so that in obedience to you, our creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you didn't abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you and through the prophets, you taught us 
to hope for salvation. Almighty Father, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet was without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, he proclaimed freedom. To the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death. And rising from the grave, he destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And we might no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us. You sent the Holy Spirit, your first gift for all who believe to complete your work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. Gracious Father, we now celebrate this sacrament of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit upon us, that the sharing of the bread that we break and the cup that we bless may not be for us, that may be for us the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, on the night our Lord was betrayed, He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, the body of Christ broken for us. After the supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink of this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, the blood of Christ poured out for us. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the love that brings us food from heaven, gives us the life of your dear son, and assures us that we belong to the company of all his faithful people in heaven, and on earth. Grant that strengthened by this fellowship and by the power of his Holy Spirit, we may continue his work in the world until we come to the glory of your eternal kingdom through the same Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you're able for our closing hymn, number 519, Peace in Our Time, O Lord. Peace in our time, O Lord, to all the people's peace. Be surely based upon your will and built in righteousness. Your power alone can break the fetters that enchain the sorely stricken soul of life and make it live again. Too long mistrust and fear have held our souls in thrall. Sweep through the earth, keen breath of heaven, and sound a nobler call. Come as you did of old, 
so great that men shall cast aside all other gods and turn to you again. Oh, shall we never learn the truth all time has taught that without God as architect our building comes to naught. O living Christ who still does all our burden share, come now and dwell within the hearts of all men everywhere. And now, as you depart, receive this benediction from the Lord. May the God of all grace, who has made us a people pure in heart to be, peacemakers among the nations and among all peoples, go with us and be seen at work in us and work through us, both now and forever. Amen. Thank you.